Good afternoon from the Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia. I'm NASA's Josh Byerly. It has been more than five and a half years worth of work between NASA and Orbital Sciences and several weeks worth of work here at the flight facility getting ready for tomorrow's launch. And now it is time for Cygnus to fly. Tomorrow's launch is scheduled for 10.50 a.m. Eastern Time. Of course, we'll have live coverage here on NASA television beginning at 10.15 a.m. Eastern Time, 9.15 a.m. Central Time. Here to give us more details about what's ahead is Alan Lindemoyer, NASA's Commercial Crew and Cargo Program Manager. We are also joined by Frank Culbertson, Executive Vice President from Orbital Sciences. We are also joined by Mike Pinkston, and Terry's Program Manager from Orbital Sciences. And we also have Sarah Doherty, who will be the uh, test director for tomorrow. She and her team will be in charge of actually launching the rocket. We're going to take some questions from here at Wallops at the end of each of the statements from the panelists. We'll go around to the other NASA centers. And we're also taking questions on social media. If you would like to use the hashtag AskNASA, we'll see if we can get them in as well. Let's get started with Alan. Thank you, Josh. Well, certainly very excited and happy to be here today on the uh, preparation for the COTS demonstration of the orbital vehicle, the new Antares and the new Cygnus uh, cargo carrying spacecraft to the International Space Station. This is a result of partnerships that have been cultivated on so many different levels over the last several years. Certainly a very close cooperation between NASA and Orbital, our commercial partner, and Orbital developed very close, of course, working relationships with their international partners and their domestic uh, partners. And then it involved, uh, because uh, this being a commercial mission, uh, close cooperation with the FAA here at the NASA Wallops Flight Facility, uh, the, the range at Wallops, uh, the state of Virginia, and the brand new uh, commercial spaceport here uh, at Mars at Pad Zero A, and a very close cooperation with the International Space Station, who has helped uh, with all of the technical integration of these new vehicles, uh, allowing it to uh, approach and do a demonstration mission to the space station. Uh, so the partnership's very important, very critical to uh, the success of this program. Let's see, if we can pull up the first chart, I'll just recap our Space Act agreement uh, with Orbital. Orbital uh, was awarded the Space Act in 2008, February 2008, after a very intense competition. We had a very healthy group of uh, potential participants in COTS on the second round competition, and Orbital came out on top as uh, the company that had the uh, our highest level of confidence that they would be able to complete their uh, development and demonstration. and. Uh, we are certainly glad to be here today at the culmination of that demonstration effort. Um, we, in our agreement with Orbital, we agreed to a series of milestones, uh, 29 milestones over the course of the agreement, uh, and this is be the, the last one. This is the last uh, uh, milestone that we have in the agreement with Orbital. On the next chart, I can show you these milestones. Each one of the dots represents one of those 29 checkpoints. You could back up one. Uh, I would uh, speak to this series of milestones here. Now, these milestones are checkpoints for us, and any one of them could have been uh, an off-ramp for us. If we, if we were uh, observing that uh, there was not sufficient progress being made or Orbital was not able to complete one of the milestones, and we didn't have any uh, confidence that they would be able to continue, well then, then that could have been an off-ramp. But in all the cases, these turned out being rewards for Orbital instead. And that's how we made our incremental payments to Orbital uh, up to $288 million worth of NASA contribution. Uh, it was a period of development over about five and a half years, starting with design and development, going through a test and production program, and culminating here with two flight demonstrations, uh, the first successful flight of Antares last April, and now uh, tomorrow's flight of the demonstration to the space station. Okay, next chart, please. So with our agreement with Orbital, we agreed to an end-to-end -end 
demonstration of their system. Orbital is responsible for the entire mission from receiving our cargo from NASA, launching, delivering on orbit, and then safely uh, disposing and re-entering uh, re of the vehicle. So as uh, part of the agreement, we've detailed uh, a number of key mission objectives, the pre-launch, including uh, things for uh, receiving cargo, packing and loading into the Cygnus vehicle and the pressurized cargo module, uh, demonstrating the ability to take our late load, that is cargo that we would like to load in the vehicle uh, just days before mission, and then completing the countdown polling and getting ready for launch. Of course, in the launch sequence, we would see the separation of the first stage, the operation of the second stage, inserting Cygnus into the proper orbit, uh, checking out the vehicle, and making sure there's good communications throughout the flight. On orbit, there will be a series of demonstration maneuvers on the way to the space station. Uh, there are gates of 10 separate demonstrations that will occur, the first of which will occur uh, the day after launch, demonstrating uh, abort procedures, hold procedures, and uh, our GPS, global positioning system navigation. And then over the coming days, there will be a series of other demonstrations leading up to the approach, rendezvous, and capture and berthing with the space station. Once berth, uh, the Cygnus, uh, for the first time, will be uh, mated with the space station at the common uh, berthing mechanism. That'll be checked out. And uh, the day after uh, capture and berthing, they will be ingress into the vehicle, and then they will begin the operations of transferring the cargo and, and stowing uh, the uh, cargo that's accumulated on the station for uh, disposal when it com uh, comes back after about 30 days on orbit. Uh, so about uh, 30 days after part um, approach and berthing, there will be the departure maneuvers, and then two days later, there will be a reentry over the South Pacific. So why don't we pull up the uh, video here, and, we, and I, I can talk through what we would expect to see over the coming days. Tomorrow morning, it's going to be a beautiful day here at Wallops, ready for launch at 10.50 in the morning. And we'll see that first stage burn for about four minutes. About a minute and 20 seconds after this first stage uh, cuts off, you'll see the fairing separation. And then the second stage will ignite, burning for about two and a half minutes, sending Cygnus into its uh, insertion orbit. Cygnus will separate from the second stage after about 10 minutes. And then a minute and a half later, uh, we'll see Cygnus come to life, and it will, uh, the solar rays will begin to deploy about 11 minutes, 33 seconds into the mission. And it takes about 30, sec 30 minutes for that to completely deploy and get checked out. Then Cygnus will begin its four-day journey to the space station. Uh, doing uh, several uh, maneuvers and uh, phasing burns to catch up with the space station. If all goes well, there'll be uh, go, no, goes, and if, if, if everything looks good, we'll give the go to approach the station. And then on September 22nd right now, at about 7.25 a.m. Eastern Time, we will see our crew members capture the Cygnus and then begin the birthing process. And that birthing process takes about an hour and a half by the time our crew captures the uh, vehicle and then actually gets birth to the, uh, the node on the bottom of the space station there. So once birthed, it'll be checked out the next day, they'll open the hatch, and then it'll begin 30 days of activity uh, on orbit. Uh, there's about 1,300 pounds of supplies on the vehicle. Different things from food, clothing, office supplies. Uh, it is not fully packed for this demonstration mission, but it certainly uh, is, is got some uh, important and uh, critical supplies for the station. So October 22nd is the current uh, plan time, uh, date for unberthing 
the Cygnus from the space station. It'll do a series of departure maneuvers. And then approximate, uh, about two days later, after uh, the Cygnus departs the station, we'll, we'll see a re-entry uh, burn and then a safe re-entry over the South Pacific. And that will be the end of the Takats demonstration mission. This is certainly a demonstration not only of the technical capabilities of the system, but also of how well we work together with this new way of doing business with uh, public-private partnerships. Uh, it's been very successful with the uh, bringing on board uh, the cargo services from the SpaceX, who have successfully flown now two resupplies to the uh, missions to the space station. Uh, we've extended this model into our commercial crew partnerships, and we expect that there will be many other opportunities as we continue exploring into deeper into space. I want to thank my team, um, Bruce Manners and my team, for working day to day from the very beginning to help make this happen. Of course, Orbital being a fantastic partner, uh, overcoming all the challenges to get here. Uh, the International Space Station, who worked so very hard uh, with all of their experts, making sure that everything was ready to go, uh, having this system meeting the interfaces to the space station requirements. Um, this, this is uh, so critical to NASA to continue to resupply the station so it can do its amazing uh, discoveries uh, on orbit. And by turning over these capabilities to low Earth orbit, this is allowing NASA to focus on the, uh, the, the more uh, challenging uh, efforts of continuing human exploration into deeper into space. So thank you very much, and I'll be glad to take your questions uh, at the end of the briefing. Frank. Thank you very much, Alan. And um, it's uh, very exciting for us to be here today. Um, I bring greetings from our CEO, David Thompson, uh, who will be here this afternoon, along with other senior management from Orbital. And uh, this is one of the most exciting things that's happening in the middle of a very exciting month for Orbital, for NASA, and for space programs around the world. There's a lot of launches, re-entries, uh, events going on that people should pay a lot of attention to. And we're happy to be the focus of attention for today and tomorrow. Uh, launching Antares tomorrow is going to be a major step in, uh, in our program. Uh, and in fact, the final step for the COTS program. And um, Alan, thank you very much for all you've done to uh, uh, keep this program going and to, to work closely with us. You and your team have been phenomenal. And uh, on behalf of David and the rest of the team, I want to ex echo some of what Alan said and extend our thanks to other folks in NASA. The uh, folks here at Wallops have worked very hard to help get us ready, to work with us, to build a HIF, to to work with us in the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport, who we also appreciate their contributions to, to make this a reality, this, this commercial launch operation at Wallops Island. The International Space Station Program and the other teams at uh, JSC and at KSC and at Marshall have contributed, and we certainly appreciate all of that effort, too. Uh, it's truly been uh, a team that has been focused on making this a reality, this cargo resupply service. And, uh, and we're going to take a next st big step tomorrow in, in, uh, in turning that into a service for Orbital. We're going to carry 700 kilograms to the space station uh, on Cygnus. And, um, and uh, Cygnus is a spacecraft that I'll de describe in a little more detail in just a moment. Uh, but that's also going to be a very exciting day for us in about four or five days. Um, why don't we go ahead and, and uh, roll the video that we have. This is um, video from the test flight in, in uh, April, and I'm sure Mike is going to speak a little bit more about Antares and that. But you can see that the uh, uh, sequence of events work very smoothly. Here's the separation of the first and second stage, and now the fairing uh, that surrounds the payload uh, separates. Then the uh, uh, second stage separates from its fairing and uh, ignites and takes us into orbit. The Cygnus itself, the service module, was built at Dulles at our satellite manufacturing facility. Uh, it's one of our larger spacecraft and uh, based in many ways on the legacy of our GEO and LEO spacecraft. 
It's integrated with the uh, pressurized cargo module, which was uh, sent ahead of time by our partners from uh, Talis Elenia, and we really appreciate the, the uh, hard work that they've put into this. They are running well ahead of schedule, and have produced a fantastic piece of hardware based on many uh, of the modules that they've built in the past successfully for the space program. And you can see here we are integrating the PCM and the, um, and the service module prior to transporting it to the island so it could be fueled a couple of months ago. And then uh, it has been integrated to the uh, rocket itself. And Mike has some pictures to show you about that. <coughs> the cargo was loaded while it was in the H-100, which is on the main base across the road. And then the uh, fuel was added uh, on the island prior to going into the HIF, the horizontal integration facility, where it was mated with the, uh, the rocket itself. So from a technical standpoint, uh, we are ready to go. We've conducted numerous joint mission simulations with the uh, mission control team in Houston. We've been through a lot of uh, contingency scenarios and, and worked through many problems to, to reach this point. Uh, we're very proud of our team, uh, the folks who do our INT, the people who've done our engineering development, our safety and mission assurance that have made sure we stayed on track have, have done a great job of getting us to this point. And the launch team who did a great rehearsal a couple of days ago, uh, we have a tremendous confidence in and, and we're looking forward to them making a good delivery on orbit. Um, I'll talk more after the launch about uh, uh, the significance of this accomplishment and, and where we're going and where we're going next. But I just want to mention that, that um, after we do that reentry in about uh, a month, Alan, we'll have about six weeks to turn around for the next launch in December, Mike. <laughs> and and uh, we'll be looking for a ride right before Christmas, so uh, you know, watch out for the holiday traffic. But um, uh, but we're going to keep going, and, and we're going to uh, fulfill our obligations on the contract once we finish this uh, this demonstration. Again, a very exciting week for Orbital. Uh, tomorrow is going to be a very exciting day. It's kind of like how long can you hold your breath? But uh, uh, but the team is ready. Uh, the weather's looking good, and and uh, all the people that have contributed to this have, have really paid attention to detail, and I'm sure that, that things are going to go well. So I look forward to your questions, and, and I'm sure we'll be talking later. Thanks. And now I'd like to introduce Mike Pinckney, who is the program manager for the Antares. <coughs> Pinkston, Frank. Pinkston. 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 Sorry. <laughs> uh, well, uh, <clears throat> on, beh on behalf of uh, the Antares team, I'd also like to add, uh, you know, how excited we are to be here for this uh, this big event tomorrow. Uh, certainly the uh, test flight back in April was a huge and important milestone, but uh, we all know the big event is, is the one coming up tomorrow and in terms of uh, Orbital really demonstrating our capability to put cargo on the station. And uh, the Antares team is excited to be a part of it and, uh, and we're ready to go. So uh, with that, we'll, uh, if you could bring up my first uh, graphic, we'll show you some photos of uh, Kind of the process recently of uh, getting to this point. Uh, the first one is a is a picture of the HIF <clears throat> uh, two three weeks ago. Uh, those of you that were on the tour today, uh, you'll note that it was uh, quite a bit more packed uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, up on the top left uh, of the of the picture, you'll see the cot, uh, the Orb D1 uh, rocket. It's uh, fully integrated. It's got the main engine system on the back, and you can see the. Uh, uh, mounted to the front uh, of it, the, the second stage. Uh, up in front of it is actually the, the upper stack assembly for the Orb 1 mission uh, coming up in, in December. Uh, in the center uh, is the, uh, right in front of you is the fairing for, for Orb D1, and then behind it is the core for the Orb 1 mission, and then all, over on the far right you'll see the tell uh, waiting for the, for the rocket, and then up in the foreground you can see Cygnus uh, under wraps uh, sitting on a, on a uh, skid waiting for uh, for integration. Uh, there's quite a uh, you know a, a game of moving stuff around. Once we actually got to the point uh, a couple of weeks ago of moving the Koch rocket over to the tell, and then as you saw in the in the HIF today, the the Orb One core has now been moved over to the the ra or the east uh, rail and and is in the final throes of getting ready for the mission in December. So if you could bring up the next one. This is a photo of, uh, of the uh, Cygnus after integration. Uh, we, we, we break the Cygnus over, put it on a handling cart, and then roll it up to the front end of the, of the second stage and, and mate it together. It goes through a series of system checkouts to make sure all the interfaces are working properly. Uh, and then uh, you can see a, a fixture up on the front uh, that uh, allows the uh, Cygnus team access to the hatch where they can do the late cargo load. Uh, and then they'll button the hatch back up, uh, pressurize it, uh, and then we're ready for, uh, for fairing installation at that point. 
And if you go to the next one, you can see us uh, actually at the, at the final end of uh, encapsulating the, the, the payload with, with the payload fairing. <clears throat> uh, obviously those big handling fixtures come off and, and we bolt it on, get the, uh, uh, get the dollies out from under it, and then it's uh, pretty much ready to roll out to the pad. And on to the next uh, graphic there, you can see it coming out the door. So uh, we rolled out uh, after midnight, uh, early early Friday morning, uh, delayed a little bit by, by the weather. You can see some of the rain still on the, on the ground underneath it. Uh, it's about a, an hour journey from the HIF uh, up to the launch mount. Uh, and after uh, a few struggles uh, to get the thing all aligned properly, uh, we finally got it up and vertical uh, in the afternoon on Friday. Uh, and I think if you cut to the next picture, you'll see, uh, uh, you'll see Antares uh, vertical on the pad with Cygnus safely under the fairing. And uh, you can't tell from that photo, but there's a flurry of activity down there uh, getting all the final preparations done. Uh, we finished up all of our testing, last, last testing, last of the testing last night. Uh, and today has been pretty much dedicated to closing up the rocket, some final walk downs by our engineering team. And then uh, this afternoon, uh, shortly after this briefing, uh, they'll be doing the final arming and, uh, and getting ready for our team to be back on console about 2.30 in the morning for, uh, for a launch tomorrow about 10.50. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll look forward to questions. Uh, but Sarah Doherty. Can I have it go back? Yeah, you can have it go back. I'm sorry, can I have it go back? You can't. <laughs> All right, uh, I apologize. Um, I wanted to announce one other thing, uh, and that's uh, something we announced earlier, but just so everybody is, is uh, aware of it and informed. Uh, Orbital has a tradition of naming our spacecraft, and um, this one has a very special name. It's named after an individual who was an uh, explorer in space, a shuttle astronaut, and an Orbital employee for a long time with great ties to this, this program. Unfortunately, he passed away about five years ago. However, uh, he was really part of the inspiration for Orbital being uh, selected for both the COTS and the CRS programs, and that's uh, Mr. G. David Lowe. Uh, G. David was a friend of mine and a classmate of mine at NASA, but also an amazing engineer, uh, a great father and uh, husband, and a terrific friend to many of us. Uh, but he had a vision of exploring space and wanted to explore further himself. Um, but I think he'd be proud of what we've done so far, and I think he'd be very, he is very much a part of it based on uh, what he has done over the years. And so we have named the, this first spacecraft to, to uh, rendezvous and berth with the space station for orbital, the spaceship G. David Lowe. And uh, his family will be here to watch the launch, and we're very proud of that, but also very humbled by the fact that someone so special will be remembered in this way. And now Sarah Doherty. <laughs> All right, thank you, Frank. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sarah Doherty. I'm the test director here on the NASA Wallops launch range uh, for the mission tomorrow. So. Uh, as that, my responsibilities are for ensuring the vehicle has a clear path uh, to space and also to uh, ensure that we can track it on its way there. So earlier today, our facility director, Bill Robel, granted authority to proceed, which is our final gate to uh, a go for launch. So that has uh, been granted and that was our final milestone today. So now we're just ready to carry out the, the countdown and the mission plan that we have uh, spent weeks and months uh, creating. Um, if you go to my first graphic, uh, this is just a picture of our range instrumentation that we have ready to track the vehicle tomorrow. We have uh, radars and telemetry antennas. Uh, that will track the vehicle from here at Wallops as well as other sites in Coquina, North Carolina, and um, in Bermuda. So all those sites have been configured and tested and verified, ready to go for tomorrow's launch operation. Um, another part of safe flight is uh, ensuring the launch area is clear prior to launch, and so uh, we have gotten approval from external agencies such as the FAA and the Fleet Forces Area Control VACAPES uh, to ensure the airspace and the ocean surface space is clear uh, tomorrow for our flight. If you go to my next graphic, you'll see there uh, it's a, a fairly good sized area, but this is our ship avoidance area and we have published uh, notice to mariners 
to um, notify everyone that this area is the hazard area for our launch and we'll be uh, working in coordination with the Coast Guard and the Virginia Marine Police tomorrow to ensure this area is clear. Um, as always, we appreciate the support from our local mariners here to cooperate and coordinate with us and that's been a, a really great partnership for all of our missions. Um, the next uh, graphic that I have is something everyone is probably waiting for and that's the launch weather forecast. Uh, this was uh, the L minus 48 hour forecast so it was uh, the forecast yesterday for tomorrow um, and it is still valid. It is uh, barely changed from yesterday to today so uh, the forecast is uh, for partly cloudy uh, skies, winds out of the east with 9 to 14 knots uh, temperature will be in the very low 70s, maybe high 60s. Uh, very good distance and visibility with seven miles there and about a 25% chance of low clouds. So from a, a launch weather perspective, that's a, a very favorable forecast with the, the only issue that we may run into is some low level cloudiness, but uh, all things still looking good. And finally, I'll move to my last graphic. This is a visibility map um, where we can see uh, the rocket launch across uh, the ocean space there and the flight should be visible uh, from about New York City down the east coast to almost the border of North Carolina or South Carolina um, at certain times of flight. So if you're uh, anywhere uh, along the central east coast there, you should be able to, to get a glimpse of launch tomorrow. So with that, I'll turn it back over to our host. Okay. Let's uh, take some questions from here first, then we'll go to the phone lines. And again, we're taking questions on social media. You just use the hashtag AskNASA, and we'll, uh, we'll get you into the briefing. Let's start down here in the front with Ken. Hi, Ken Kramer for Universe Today. Um, two quick questions for anybody. Uh, can you tell us what were the late stow items, and are there any goodies for the astronauts on board? I'm not sure. The the late stow was whatever NASA gave us, and we think it's <laughs> we think it's food and some some tools that were uh, specified later, maybe some spare parts. It was about 140 kilograms worth of uh, worth of hardware. We don't actually open the bags and look at them, and uh, it's generally usually just a general list of what uh, what they're, we're carrying. And yes, there are some goodies for the astronauts on board. Okay, uh, let's go over here to Irene, then we'll come to Tarek. Hi, um, Irene Klotz with Reuters. I have uh, several questions. Um, I think the first is for, for Frank. Um, could you just go through the um, how long Cygnus could stay on orbit on battery without having the solar arrays out, first of all, and, and, and I guess in a general sense, then some other kind of um, uh, uh, edge of the seat <laughs> moments for you guys in the flight control centers? Well, we can we can survive for approximately 24 hours uh, without the solar arrays fully deployed. Um, if one were to deploy and not the other, then we'd have a little bit longer and we'd have to evaluate uh, our situation. Uh, but we think we have a very reliable system. Dutch Space builds the arrays and they have a, a really good track record with, with deploying them. And so we think that that'll, uh, that'll happen on time. And then we'll be able to, to continue with the normal rendezvous. We have to worry about this also during the grapple operation or the rendezvous and grapple operation because we're not always facing the sun with the solar arrays during that time frame. And so once we are grappled, we do take power from the station. But if they're not able to transfer power, we then still have the 24 hour limit of fully charged batteries being able to, to power the spacecraft. And what was the other question? Uh, just uh, on a more general sense, other key moments in the. Um, everything that would be new from what you tested and saw from the Antares demo flight to what you need to do to well, achieve this mission. Yeah, the test flight demonstrated all the key events of getting us into orbit, uh, and so we'll be watching that again. And you always watch those very carefully, but uh, we have a lot of confidence that they'll repeat. Uh, once we get in orbit, the first thing, of course, is to deploy the solar arrays and power up the spacecraft. So we'll be looking for signals that the spacecraft has, in fact, uh, does in fact have power and it has activated its guidance and control. Solar arrays are deployed and then it, it's, um, if we for some reason had a malfunction during launch and were not inserted in the proper orbit, then we'd also be looking for an early burn. But we don't anticipate that being likely at all. 
And uh, so we'll be looking then for the, for the next burn to put us into a circular orbit and start on our chase for the station. And uh, for Alan, um, the, uh, what does NASA consider mission success for this? And I understand, I know 2.5 million in the scheme of things is not a lot, but is that money contingent on um, a certain um, outcome of this mission? We, we carefully planned our payment uh, schedule to Orbital so that uh, most of the funding was available up front when they needed to, to uh, complete the, the more costly work of doing the development demonstration and test. So this is just a, a last payment we reserved for the completely successful uh, demonstration of the mission. So I showed you the mission objectives. Those are what we laid out in our Space Act Agreement, and uh, those are other criteria for success. Uh, thanks, and I have also just a kind of a continuing from this to the commercial resupply contract. Um, the GAO had a report earlier this summer about the payments that NASA's made to Orbital. I guess about a third of the money of the 1.9 has already been paid, so this might be a combination question for the two of you. Was that money needed to get to this point on the COTS um, program um, is one part, and then the other part is um, if, uh, if there's a problem with this flight, would NASA be okay with going ahead with commercial resupply, or how does that work? And I, I know you probably went through this with us with SpaceX, but I don't remember. Um, what the criteria was, if there was some other work that would need to be done, if the company is responsible for that, or how that would work. Thanks. Well, let me take the last question first. The SpaceX uh, flight was a little different because it was the second of three planned flights, and we granted approval for SpaceX to uh, attempt to complete the comp full demonstration to the space station on the second flight. If there was a problem, SpaceX uh, was planning to repeat the demonstration on, on a third COTS demonstration. That's not the situation here. We only have two flights planned with Orbital, the, the maiden flight of Antares, and then this would be uh, the one and only demonstration we had planned under the COTS agreement. So this will be the, the culmination of the COTS program one way or another. Now, most likely, whatever problems are encountered, uh, I am confident that Orbital will be able to overcome the problem and that uh, we will continue on into the uh, resupply service missions to the station under that contract. And we're operating under sort of the same premise, depending on what the problem was. They need the cargo, so I'm assuming they'll, they'll press forward with that. In terms of the um, uh, report that you're speaking of uh, earlier, um, first of all, COTS and CRS are two totally separate contracts, two totally separate financing arrangements, and they're accounted for totally separately in the company. One's a Space Act agreement with um, our own company investment involved, and the other one is a fixed-price FAR-based contract uh, with, with NASA, with the International Space Station Program. In the first case, uh, in COTS, the orbital investment far exceeds the NASA investment, and, uh, and so, you know, that's not something we reveal in detail, but, but the, the fact remains that, that uh, NASA is a major investment, and they set it up to be uh, fairly front-loaded from their perspective, but it's even more front-loaded and, and heavier on, on Orbital itself. And, and um, uh, so we're hoping for a long series of CRS missions to, to hopefully recoup some of that. As far as CRS goes, um, the report pointed out, I don't remember the exact percentage of how much has been paid to Orbital up to this point, um, and you said about a third. Well, I have to point out, we've, we have uh, actually accomplished close to 75 percent of the work required to execute those eight missions. So we're not being paid ahead. Uh, we're, in fact, there's a significant holdback that depends on us successfully launching, docking, and unloading the, or berthing, and then unloading the cargo. Uh, before we receive a significant portion of the payment on any given mission. So it's a lot of money, and there's no doubt about that, but we're providing a lot of work, and, uh, and we're going to carry a lot of cargo. And, and when you add the numbers up, you'll see how much it is compared to other people's predictions. Okay, let's go to Robert, and then we'll take a few more in here, then we'll go to the phone lines and come back. Hi, Robert Perlman with uh, CollectSpace.com. I think for Frank. Um, 
Can you preview what we'll see tomorrow in terms of cameras and throughout the, the flight um, in terms of separation of Cygnus and then as Cygnus flies approaching the station, are there cameras to give views from there? The cameras you'll see on launch will be very similar to what we saw on the test flight. Um, hopefully they'll look almost identical. Hope so. <laughs> and, um, and including the sequence of events. Uh, and then when we're on orbit, there is a camera on the uh, um, spacecraft, uh, but I'm not sure how much it'll show, Carl, when we're approaching. Uh, Real-time, uh, it's, yeah. it's all down like that. Right. Yeah, Real-time, there won't really be anything except what comes down from the station looking at us, uh, but the Cygnus camera will be downloaded or downlinked later uh, because we have bandwidth uh, restrictions on being able to send it all down live. So you'll see some things later. Tarek. Thank you, Tarek Malik with uh, Space.com. I think my question is for Alan. Yeah, uh, we saw um, the successful Antares flight in April. You had a, a, a SpaceX launch in a, a month prior to that. You've got another orbital flight uh, at the end of the year, and then SpaceX again. And I'm just wondering how vital it is to have a redundancy now of, um, of cargo access to the station with orbital flights now. Um, to, to really kind of give NASA the flexibility it needs to have more than one to rely on? Well, that's always an important factor. Uh, we, we, we don't, you never want to be put in a situation where if there's a problem with one of the suppliers that you don't have the ability to continue your resupply chain to the space station. Um, so we intentionally uh, designed our program to have at least two companies certainly in the development and demonstration phase. And then, and then uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to award contracts to both of them as well. So I think that's an important factor, uh, both to keep a good, healthy uh, uh, competition uh, for uh, uh, as the uh, market for space service, uh, services is developing, and then, and then uh, having a, a redundant, uh, dissimilar capability is, is certainly a, a, a strong point for uh, carrying to uh, suppliers for the space station. Okay. Philip, and then we'll go over here, and then we'll go to the phone lines. Go ahead. Philip Sloss with nasaspaceflight.com. I think for Ms. Doherty, um, what's, the, uh, what's your uh, weather rules for low-level clouds in terms of uh, ceiling and thickness? Uh? Um, it, it's not, I don't know all the, the uh, specific numbers off the top of my head, but it's uh, visibility. We have a certain requirement for our uh, safety folks that are visual spotters to ensure the vehicle has actually uh, gotten off the pad and heading down range. We have a cloud ceiling requirement for that. Um, and then other just general visibility for our radars and tracking things like that. So it's hard to, um, if you have bad environmental effects on your radars that could, but uh, the low cloud ceilings are probably not going to come into play too much tomorrow with only a 25 percent chance of them being there and with the launch window at, at the small duration that it is, um, I think we'll see that there is uh, enough visibility out there at that time of morning that we'll be able to have clear skies. Okay, one more in here, then we'll go to the phone lines. If you're on the phone lines, just stand by. I'll call on your name. It's coming up here uh, shortly, right over here. All right, thanks, guys. I'm Evan Kozloff I'm from WVOC. I have another question for Ms. Doherty. Um, basically, with this new partnership of public and private, uh, it brings kind of a new space race, uh, some new excitement. And I know there are competitors on the other side of the coast. Uh, Wallops has a long history. How important is this, uh, this launch tomorrow as a further investment into Wallops? Oh, it, it certainly is. Um, we, we're happy to have uh, Orbital here and be involved in all of these missions. Um, it's uh, brought a lot of work to our facility, um, a lot of uh, new people and great opportunities and partnerships for us. So it's been a, a really good thing to have them here and uh, to continue um, launching missions and, and keep this a very active place uh, to be. So rocket launch is, of course, just one of the things we do amongst uh, a host of other things, unmanned aerial vehicles and aircraft missions. So. Uh, just one more way for us to, to be involved in uh, NASA's uh, missions. Sarah, could I add to that? Sure. Uh, from Orbital's perspective, this is a, a, a really great partnership with uh, uh, NASA, 
with Wallops and with the state of Virginia and the Wallops community. Uh, we feel like we've been welcomed here. People seem enthusiastic about the business that we've brought, the jobs we've brought. We've created a couple hundred jobs in the area at least, and uh, we hope for that hope for that to continue for many years to come. But the best thing is we've seen people uh, come with a lot of interest in what we're doing who want to, to learn more about it and who want to figure out how they can be a part of it, from students in the local schools and the teachers to the uh, Chamber of Commerces and the uh, Chambers of Commerce and, and the uh, local business leaders. And, and we really appreciate the support and interest. And uh, we hope that, that uh, people will see we are trying very hard to contribute to the economy here, to, to the opportunities for people in the area. And, um, and we certainly appreciate the efforts of the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport, the Virginia Space Flight Authority, and the Virginia Department of Transportation in helping empower all of that. They've been a, uh, an essential part of uh, <coughs> all this development. Thanks. Okay, let's go to the phone lines. We're going to come back here after we go to the phone lines and take some more questions from in the room and also social media. Again, <coughs> use the hashtag AskNASA and we'll get your questions in as much as we can. So Tracy Watson with USA Today, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. I wanted to ask Ms. Darty about the visibility. What can people up and down the coast expect to see? I mean, I think a lot of people will be looking for a rocket. Um, so what, 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 what's the most they can expect to see? And um, also, how big an area are you clearing of mariners, and what kind of boats normally use that area? Thank you. Okay, your uh, first question, of course, uh, unless you're very close to here, you will actually not see a rocket uh, flying through the sky, but you'll see uh, a contrail or a f a flames from the stages uh, burning in flight. So depending on how far away you are, we'll, those will be the types of things you'll see. And it certainly won't look quite like a, an aircraft contrail. It'll be much, much larger uh, and, and much lower and in a different shape. But um, certainly uh, clouds and uh, potentially some flames from the stage burnings, depending on the, the lighting and where the sun is at that time. And could you repeat the second question? Tracy, are you still there? Oh, ship avoidance? Okay. Oh, right. Um, the area is about uh, 80 nautical miles from the coast out uh, offshore. Um, and that's just the uh, area we like to uh, give for everybody as notice. Uh, of course, it depends on the uh, sea state and the winds on launch day uh, about where exactly boats can be positioned um, out there in the ocean. But we actively uh, work that. Uh, like I mentioned before, we have assets here, aircraft and boats uh, that we use, as well as our partners with the US Coast Guard and the Virginia Marine Police to keep that area clear. Okay, let's go to Frank Mooring with Aviation Week. Frank, are you there? Yes, thank you. Uh, this is for uh, Frank Culbertson. Um, Alan mentioned um, a growing competition down the road in, in uh, uh, commercial space services. I wonder if you could discuss a little bit how important this launch is, or a successful mission is, um, to Orbital's plans to um, extend the service to other customers besides NASA, whether you have any um, payloads or, or prospects of payloads under your two government contracts right now, and also how many, um, how many missions you could support with your, with your current um, infrastructure there at Wallops. Uh, thank you, Frank. That's a good question. Um, as far as the number of missions, we have hardware either here or poised to be shipped here for the next two missions. And so we're in good shape from a hardware standpoint. Um, and we could support up to 10 missions with the uh, current orders that we have in place with our major suppliers, uh, both in the U.S. and overseas. Uh, we can go beyond that, of course, if, uh, if uh, NASA comes uh, forward with other requests for cargo delivery or other customers come in with firm orders. Uh, this, order, this launch and uh, delivery is extremely important to the future of the company on, on this um, line of business uh, because it will demonstrate to people uh, twice the reliability of the Antares and then, of course, the reliability and capability of the Cygnus spacecraft. We don't have any other specific orders for individual missions. We have a few orders for payloads and, and other uh, endeavors that want to use our services while we're on orbit with Cygnus. Uh, or to use the launch as a secondary way of getting to orbit. However, we do feel that, uh, we do know that we have a lot of interest 
from people who are waiting to, to make sure we do, in fact, succeed with this before they place a firm order, and we think they'll be coming. And we have the capability to launch more than twice a year here from Wallops, probably four times a year, uh, could easily be supported if, uh, if we have the orders for that. And so we're looking forward to what will come next, and, uh, and we feel like this will fill a need in the country uh, for scientific uh, observing and, uh, uh, and possibly even national security payloads going forward. And um, as well as uh, supplying services and capability to the human spaceflight program and helping the space station continue to expand because that is really important that we continue to keep people on the space station, keep it supplied, and keep that outpost in space uh, so that we don't lose that toehold. Okay, let's go to James Dean with Florida today. Hi, thanks. A couple of questions for Mr. Culberson. Um, with the not just slipping a day. I think you're planning to reach the station a little bit faster now. Uh, could you discuss any, you know, what the impact of that has been on compressing that timeline a little bit, and, and how likely do you think it might be that um, you might want that extra day back? Um, we were planning on rendezvousing in five days and rendezvousing on the 22nd. Uh, we're now going to do it in four days. Uh, we did have margin in that five days, and uh, it's not been very challenging to replan. Uh, we can fit that in pretty easily. Uh, however, we can delay a day or two if necessary. It's just that it would inconvenience the crew and affect the planning that they have for the, for the week going forward, and we're trying to, to avoid that if possible. Uh, but NASA is flexible in that regard and can replan if, if necessary. Uh, we do have the 10 demonstrations that we have to conduct en route to the station, and we have time to do those in the four days. Um, and then we will uh, uh, execute early on the 22nd, as was mentioned. We can stay on orbit for 30 days uh, easily, uh, loading disposable car cargo for reentry. Um, and if necessary, if for some reason we delayed the launch and, and had a conflict with the Soyuz launch that's coming up, we could actually loiter on orbit uh, waiting for the uh, rendezvous activity uh, for a week uh, or even up to two or three months if necessary. So we've got the fuel and the um, uh, technical capability to go for an extended period on orbit. We also can go for an extended period after undocking, unberthing, and release if that were necessary or required by future um, future payloads. And we will do that in the future on the probably starting on around the fourth or fifth mission, where we'll stay on orbit for longer periods of time and conduct some experiments or activities for customers before we re-enter. Re so the spacecraft was designed to operate for a long period of time, and we will do that as as uh, requested. All right, we've got two more on the phone lines, and we'll come back here and take some social media questions. Alan Boyle uh, with MSNBC. Are you there? The module part of it. Um, could you explain a little further just how similar that is to an MPLM or the ATV's cargo module? Um, are they, like, basically identical, or are there, are there important differences? And, and could you also describe, I don't know if you could just sort of describe what it might feel like if you were inside it in terms of volume when it's not packed full of stuff or just sort of what, what the volume feels like? The um, uh, Cygnus is a little bit smaller uh, than the uh, MPLM. Uh, it's that and the ATV are built by the same company, uh, so a lot of the characteristics are the same. Uh, but the Cygnus was designed specifically for carrying dry cargo, and, um, and it's set up to, to maximize the efficiency of the volume so that we can put as many bags into that space as possible up to the maximum um, uh, weight uh, carrying capability. Um, when you first go in, it's, uh, when it's fully packed, it's going to feel very crowded because you're going to have a corridor about uh, half a meter by half a meter to, to go through. But when it's empty, it's pretty roomy. And I've been inside them in the factory, and, and there's plenty of room. And it's very similar to being in an MPLM, just a little bit smaller. But the characteristics are, are similar. Um, we're not big enough to carry a full space station rack uh, without adding a secondary structure. And we also can't move a rack through our hatch because our hatch is smaller than the uh, a hatch that the station uses between MPLM and, and uh, the rest of the station, or between the station modules. We could, in fact, uh, add a larger hatch in the future if that were required or requested, uh, because we use a standard size CBM, it would, and it would fit fine in there. It's just for weight savings and volume saving reasons, we went with a smaller hatch that uh, accommodates the, the bags that we have to carry. All right, now let's check with uh, Alan Boyle. I think James got a little follow-up in there. Let's go to Alan. Hi, thank you. Uh, I guess this would be for Frank or Mike. 
relating to the glitch, the communications glitch, uh, when the rocket was brought to the pad, is there anything more to report on that, uh, how that was resolved? Uh, and then uh, I guess uh, kind of the follow-up would be if something goes wrong on orbit, for example, SpaceX had the problem with the thruster and they were able to issue commands to clear that problem, what sort of capability would Cygnus have to, to deal with uh, problems that could possibly be solved if you can communicate with the spacecraft? Thank you. Yeah, I can take. I can talk to the first part of that. The uh, uh, I think you're referring to the uh, the issue that we had the first pass through our combined systems test. Now that was in fact traced to a uh, a, ca a cable that had a, a fiber optic line in it that was that was damaged. Uh, we haven't had an opportunity to uh, to do a complete uh, diagnosis of that, but it appears it was probably damaged at some point during the rollout. Um, and, and that did cause uh, a switch up in our uh, a, a junction box we have up on, up, up on the, the tel, uh, tower uh, to need to be reset. So, so basically the, the, the fix to that uh, issue was to, to replace the cable and then go up and, and reset the power on the switch. And after that, everything uh, worked fine and has continued to work fine since, uh, uh, since we got that, that repaired. Frank, I'll let you talk to the the on-orbit question. Okay, and, and by the way, Mike Pinkston and I have worked very closely <laughs> together for the last three years. <laughs> but, but I grew up with a guy named Mike Pinkney, so. Um, oh, you knew. Yeah, but uh, uh, I think the question was, if we had problems with one of the, the um, uh, thruster uh, zones, could we reset it on orbit? And that really depends on what the problem was. We do have the capability, if we lose one of the uh, strings, to reset it if that's necessary, but we can we can certainly conduct a safe rendezvous and, and uh, grapple with with one string down. And if that didn't answer your question, please clarify it. I think that's fine. Just uh, the general capability for dealing with on-orbit problems, uh, whether you know you can. I, I, I'm just thinking, if something does go wrong, how much capability do you have to to reset or uh, kind of change the configuration? We, we have a lot of capability in that regard, and uh, we're dual fault tolerant basically in all critical systems, particularly during the uh, rendezvous and approach, uh, largely because we have to satisfy the human rating requirements of approaching the station. And we have simulated that extensively with our team and with the NASA team, and so we have a lot of confidence that we can handle virtually any problem that might occur during that phase of flight. Okay, thanks, Alan. Let's go to Joel Achenbach with the Washington Post, and we'll come back here for some uh, other questions. Joel? Did we lose Joel? Okay, Joel's gone. Let's come back here. Jason Townsend, you've got some social media questions. Indeed. This comes from Twitter user Fred Keish. Anybody know if the Cygnus will provide a reboost capability to the ISS? No, it will not. Wonderful. Also from uh, Twitter user Allison Pettit. What kind of preparations do the astronauts on board have to make prior to Cygnus's arrival? The uh, crew on board will have to uh, set up the uh, control panel that's used for monitoring and controlling the Cygnus during uh, its approach. It's the same panel they use for the HTV, so hopefully they haven't stowed it someplace they can't find it because it just left. And uh, we'll uh, do some checkout of that control box and the circuits between the station, ourselves, Houston, and Tanagashi, or, uh, uh, Scuba in Japan. Uh, to make sure all the links are working pr uh, properly. And that's the, that's the major preparation, as well as uh, whatever work they do with the ground on a planning standpoint of where they're going to stow the cargo that's coming up and staging the cargo that's going to, to go down. And they've been doing that since the beginning of the station. Sure. And last question here comes from uh, Twitter user Wondering Eye. What happens to Cygnus when it is detached a month or so after docking? Uh, as Alan said, uh, a day or two after un undocking, we will uh, fire the... the um, engine in a retrograde fashion to slow it down to, so that it begins to decay fairly rapidly in its orbit. It'll uh, re-enter the top of the atmosphere uh, targeted for a spot in the South Pacific uh, east of New Zealand that's fairly empty and, uh, and over the course of about uh, an hour it'll deorbit, hit the top of the atmosphere and burn up. And uh, a very small percentage, maybe one percent of it, might make it to the surface of the ocean. Okay, thanks, Chase. I'm going to try to get through as many as I can before we hit the top of the hour right here. Uh, yes, Anthony Fitch with Rocket Stem Media Foundation. Um, I was wondering if there is a weather violation constraint tomorrow, what do the uh, next launch opportunities look like as far as forecast goes? 
Uh, the next couple days uh, get better, actually, so they improve. So our chance of uh, low-level clouds, again, is, is the only issue of concern, and the chance decreases uh, each day. So uh, Thursday looks like only maybe a 10% chance of low-level clouds and uh, e even lower on Friday. Okay, let's try to move through these pretty quickly. Go ahead. Joanne Delaney from her, uh, I'm with NASA Social, and uh, my primary role is actually a school teacher, Hershey <laughs> Middle School. And we have lots of students following along on social media. And as the space program moves forward, my question is what is your message to young people? <laughs> Go ahead, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> My message to young people is, I hope it's as uh, inspiring as it is, uh, is to you now as it was to me when I was young, because uh, watching these amazing achievements uh, certainly uh, captured my interest, and um, I hope what you're seeing today is something that will stick with you and encourage you to keep studying, uh, working on your math and science, and all the skills that are necessary to keep the space state uh, base program going because it is it is really a, an amazing field. Okay, let's take two more. We'll come over here and then go over here. Go ahead. Okay, uh, two quick questions. Doug Mone, TMC Net. Um, first quick question: Should we expect a post-launch grass fire like at the last launch? Number one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, there was also an issue with a uh, lady, I think, as well, but it was much smaller than the colorful one at the Antares first launch. Um, secondly. Back to the cable issue. You guys had a problem with cable last time as well, where the cable disconnected. Is this a different subsystem, same subsystem, all in the same system? Can you comment on that a little bit? Because you know, two cable problems in a row suggest, eh, is it coincidence? Is it not? I, okay, I, I think I cover both of those. Uh, our our partners at Mars, I'm told, have uh, have t gotten the lawnmower out and and cut down uh, some of the uh, tall grass that was. Uh, uh, adjacent to the pad and we're, we're highly hopeful that we won't have the same kind of grass fire problem we had uh, had last time but uh, there there's always a risk of that and I think the Wallops fire department's ready to run out there and, and squelch it uh, briskly as soon as we're uh, safely away from the pad uh, and as for your your second question uh, you know coincidentally uh, and, and it is coincidentally it was the same cable that that caused us uh, problems. Uh, it was the same circuit that caused us uh, a problem this time as the one that disconnected during uh, uh, the first launch attempt on the test mission. Uh, it, it was a different cable and it was a completely different problem. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's a cable that connects from the, the pad to the bottom of the tail. Uh, that's the one that we had a problem with this time and again it's a, it's a cable that's coiled up as we roll the vehicle out to the pad and we believe it was simply something in the process of transporting that, that caused us to damage, you know, and, and it's a fiber optic cable, so it is fairly uh, uh, fragile. You know, the, the, the problem on test mission, as you recall, was, was another part of that circuit that runs up the side of the tail and across uh, to the umbilical connection at the, at the rocket. And that was uh, a combination of issues uh, that, that all conspired to, to bite us at the wrong time. Uh, but all were, were quite, quite simple to fix, including lengthening the lanyard that pulls it away at launch, uh, as well as a little tighter control of the tail itself during the final part of the countdown to keep from putting any uh, unwanted tension on that uh, release lanyard. So completely different issues, same circuit. Okay, last question over here with Irene. Thanks. Um, Irene Klotz with Reuters. I have two quick ones. Um, for Alan, the, um, I know that uh, non-essential equipment is aboard, but did uh, NASA fly anything to replace or repair or troubleshoot the EMU? Well, I know there was were discussions on that, and I did not bring the manifest with me, so I don't have uh, an absolute answer to your question right now. I have we, to follow up. We don't think there's anything uh, specific for the EMU on this one, but they're uh, hoping to fly some uh, hardware on the next one. In December. <laughs> <laughs> no, we just asked. Um, and for Frank, um, at one time Orbital was interested in the commercial crew um, development program. Are there any, is that still uh, kind of out there as a possibility for the company? We're pretty busy with all the things we got going on right now, and NASA's <laughs> proceeding on the path they're on with commercial crew. 
Okay, that is going to wrap it up for us here at the Wallops Flight Facility. Of course, we'll see you back here tomorrow for the actual launch. Our launch coverage again begins at 10.15 a.m. Eastern Time. You can watch it live here on NASA Television or, of course, on our website at www.nasa.gov. You can also follow along at nasa.gov slash orbital or nasa.gov slash station. We will see you back here tomorrow. We'll try to make sure all the frogs are off the launch pad before we take off. So <laughs> We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks again.